All right, so what I want to cover now is prepping for off season. So this is the time now that baseball season's over, it's officially the off season. Even though it's still summer, it's still like, oh man, I don't even want to think about baseball yet. You're you do need a so number one, you do need some mental time away. So whatever that is, whether it's just a month just to kind of like go fishing or do whatever you want to do. Uh, that's important. I know that when I finished up my seasons every year in September or late September, depending on the league I was in, I, uh, I just needed like a couple weeks just to do whatever. And then I'd start, right. But really you should get started as quick as you can because you're number one, trying to rebuild strength. Cause it's proven that you lose rotator cuff strength, uh, as the season goes, if you're a pitcher. And I assume that is for position players too. You throw so much that you just develop weird adaptations and you actually drain away all the off season or all the off season strength you built in your rotator cuff. So if you just kind of think of that as like an energy meter, it just depletes. So you try to build it up as high as it'll, it can be. So it's overflowing in the spring and then it just slowly depletes as the season goes. It doesn't necessarily mean your velocity goes down constantly, but your rotator cuff strength does. So number one is getting back in there and getting your rotator cuff strength back. So in our facility, we do a lot of bilateral rotator cuff stuff. We do a lot of unilateral, which means just like your one arm rotator cuff stuff. So we'd really try to get, try to restore and regenerate a lot of that rotator cuff strength. And then again, at that point, it's like, okay, everyone needs to take, and this is what I want to cover in more in depth is everyone needs to really audit themselves, like, and look hard and say, where am I today? And what do I need in the future? So if you're a kid, it might be like, man, I hope you grow. I hope you have like a growth spurt scheduled because a lot of that stuff is beyond their control. But when you're a little bit bigger, it's like, okay, it's clear that, all right, you're a 21 year old college pitcher. Uh, you definitely need to put on 10, 15 pounds this winter. You definitely need to increase your flexibility or you're pretty strong, but it looks like, okay, let's kind of like go through like, all right, your forearms are probably lagging. Your hamstrings are lagging. Your glutes are lagging. Your flexibility could use a little bit of work here's these couple of different things that we probably need to boost up before we start to like get everything else equal attention, you know, spend more attention on anything else. Just again, kind of auditing your body and figuring out where are the, where are the full buckets and what are the, the half full buckets. So let's try to fill everything up before we start to layer more on the top. So with all that, you know, you sort of periodize out your year and depending on who you are and how old you are, periodization is different. So periodization for a kid who is 130 pounds as a sophomore might be hypertrophy, which is just gaining muscle size. That might be his program for the next two years. You don't really have to periodize a ton when you have a constant goal, you know, periodization where you go hypertrophy or conditioning first. So you sort of get your ability to do work up. Then you do hypertrophy, which is again, building muscle size. Then when you've gotten the sufficient size, you go to decreased reps to build strength. And then when you built your strength, then you learn to apply that strength faster and you do explosiveness and plyometrics and, and, uh, strength speed stuff. So that's sort of like the traditional linear periodization in our f- facility. We kind of do like an undulating wave periodization where if you're a high school kid, you're probably trying to add weight almost the entire year. And so we never really lose that focus with you because if you can only, if you're 120 pounds today, our goal is to get you 185 pounds as fast as humanly possible. So while doing all these other things that are required for you to stay healthy and all, and all that. So with that in mind, we're not going to constantly periodize and have you doing Olympic lifts and all this other stuff when that's not going to support that goal of you not being 185 pounds. Cause if you're 155 pounds and you're great at power cleans, who cares? College scouts aren't going to look at you because you look like a little kid, right? So there's all these sort of prerequisites and foundations that you need to be a good athlete. And when parents ask about, should I go to the showcase? Should I do this? Should I spend money on that? And when the kid's like 14, 15, sometimes even 16, and they're like, should I spend money on the showcase? Should I spend $250 on this? I said, well, if it's just to stack your kid up against other kids where they can see how they look compared to other young men or young women, their age, uh, sure. That's fine. If you feel like that's valuable, if that's value for your money, then do it. If you're going there to be recruited to say like, okay, I want to get in front of the scout so he can like put me on his list. If they're not there yet, they're just not there. They don't like put you on the list and then like write 
I'm going to go follow him in two more years or three years. That's not really how it works. They want to know who are they going who are they going to go look at this spring and this summer, and they might like remember your name, but it's going to have no use whether they remember your name today or remember it, or they find your name for the first time in a year. If you're good in a year and you're good enough for them, they'll notice. You. It'll pay attention. But if you're not good enough today, it's not really going to matter. It's still going to be a game of wait and see. So with all of that the goal should be still long-term. Like we know that if you're going to get recruited to play college baseball, that you need to be, you know, if you're a second baseman and you're 5'10", we need to get you to at least probably 165 pounds if you're super athletic and then probably heavier than that if you're not as athletic. So how can we get you there as fast as possible? So with us, we do an undulating uh, periodization where in a given week you might have a hypertrophy day, you might have a strength day, and then another hypertrophy day, or you might have – couple hypertrophy exercises and a strength exercise where that kind of scheme is how we go because we know when you do build strength and do lower rep ranges it helps support adding more weight to your hypertrophy like 10 12 15 rep ranges so then you if you do more weight for 12 reps because you've done some lower rep stuff those help support each other and they sort of like cycle in it that's a very that's been a better we figured it over time that works a lot better than just doing three sets of 12 even when you mix exercises up and change them every three to four weeks, three sets of 12, kids don't push as hard sometimes. They don't learn what hard work is sometimes. Doing sets of four, five, and six, depending on your age, can be really beneficial in learning what is hard because a lot of times in sets of 10 and 12, it's just like taxing and it's long and it's kind of hard, but the fatigue that builds up over time is what makes it hard, whereas you don't really learn how to grind out under a barbell and how to really how fast you have to push into the, into the ground and how fast you have to try to move that bar when you're doing a three rep squat or a five rep squat, something like that, where the bar gets really heavy relative to your body weight. So there's a lot of benefits in those in teaching kids because if you kid thinks three sets of 10 at 95 pounds is hard, it might not really be that hard, except he's not, he doesn't really know what hard is yet. So when then you give him sets of five and you really push him and you squat him and you encourage him and whatever, uh, and then he learns, oh man, that was, I could do 155 for five and this is what hard feels like when that weight's really heavy. Then suddenly they start pushing that bar faster on their sets of 10. Their weight goes up really quick just because they learned that, oh, what I was doing it for 10 reps before that felt hard doesn't feel hard anymore now that I've done some heavier lower rep stuff before. So there's a lot of benefits there. But for any baseball player, there's just big things that you need to hit. So number one, you need to be big and strong enough. If you go watch... So back to these scouting combines, if you go to one of these combines, you'll see kids invariably who are way taller than you, way faster than you, throw harder, hit harder, and are physically much bigger. If you look at Division One recruits, none of them are little scrawny people. They're not. I mean, Division One baseball is full of big athletic kids. Now, there's lots of draft picks, and you'll see them every year where they're like 6'2", 170, and you're like, that kid doesn't look very formidable. Uh, but that kid throws like 93 across a diamond and is super athletic and has hands like you've never seen and can flag down a, you know, a ball just hitting a Bermuda triangle, you know, playing shortstop. So like scouts get it and then they're going to extrapolate. Okay. This kid's amazing athlete. We add 25 pounds as he grows up in our system between 18 and 20 as a minor leaguer. He's going to then hit balls, you know, off the, the jumbotron in Yankee stadium or whatever. So there's still a lot of that stuff. And, uh, but, they are projecting out usually a little farther probably when they're going to be a a pro draft guy versus a college guy. And especially at lower levels, they need guys who are like ready to help their program a little bit faster. Whereas in the minor leagues, they can give a guy knowing that he's probably going to take four years to be at the level that they want. So it can depend, you know, obviously those guys who get drafted are going to be, would easily be taken at a, a, a top college program. I'm not saying that, but, um, in general, Division One athletes, I mean, really college athletes of any caliber are big physical people. So it's easy to lose track of that sometimes, playing your little local baseball with your little group of kids that, you know, you don't go big places sometimes and realize that there's a lot of bigger kids than you. I mean, we've had kids that are eighth graders at 6'5", 225 in my facility before. They're rare, but they happen. Um you know, just like the physical maturity, most of these division one players, they mature physically way faster than everybody else. So everyone else is trying to catch up and trying to get as big and strong and physical as fast as they possibly can. 
before their junior year when they're going to be scouted. And some kids that just don't grow that fast, they're just small. That's just unfortunate. That's just the luck of the draw or the unluck of the draw. And they're probably just not going to be big and physical enough in time to be a Division One or Division Two or high-level D3 or JUCO athlete, whatever it is. So there's a lot of unfairness in all that, but that's just life as well. You know, a lot of times kids are like, oh, I throw harder than him, I throw harder than him, but I'm, I've am i had this conversation a bunch of times with my own team. It's like, well, look, yeah, you throw harder than him, but he's 140 pounds and throws 76. You're 165 pounds and you're 6'2 and you throw 78. Why are you proud of yourself? You're just a 16-year-old and he's a 14-year-old. If he was your size, he would throw like 85, right? It's all relative, but that's not really how it works either. I mean, just because a kid is 14 and throws 70 and he's 100 pounds, and then there's a kid who's 14 and is 150 pounds and throws 75, like relative speed for their body size, the smaller kid throws way harder, right? But, and probably has a better arm and better arm action that when he does get big, he'll probably throw harder than that kid. But they don't wait for that. So if you're just, you grow earlier and you're 6'2 at 14 and then you're 6'4 at 15 and then you're 195 pounds and you're throwing 88 before everyone else does, you just win, right? You just go on to, you sign early and that's that. Those kids will probably catch up to you at some point, but growing early is just a win. And that's just how college baseball is. So spending some of that money to go see how physical division one recruits are and all these other kids that's a, I think that's a benefit sometimes. It just depends on how deep your pocketbook is, I guess. But point being, a lot of kids don't realize how far they are from their goals and how physical they have to get before the start of their junior year, the start of their junior year baseball season, to really look like a finished product for a college scout's eyes. I mean, they have to go out there and say, oh, I, like that kid's good. Not like, oh, he's good and he'll be good in two years or oh, I'll put him on my list for 18 months from now. Like, when you're 17, it's pretty much go time. So with all of that, it's trying to figure out, okay, what are my biggest needs now? How do we plan this out? What does my off season need to be? And if you have five off seasons, you have 13 U off season, 14 U off season, 15 U off season, 16 U off season, 17 U off season. So that's five off seasons before your senior year. Say you don't train in August and you don't train in September and you don't train in October. You do, you get, you get, pick up baseballs or not pick up baseballs, but you just like start your off season plan again, November 1st. That's three months times five years. That's 15 months. That's 15 months, a year and a third that you lost to other kids who might've been training them. And I get it that sometimes there's a balance. You don't want to make baseball your job. You don't want to burn out. You don't want to hate it, all that stuff. But 15 months of dedicated training is a ton. It is a absolute crap load. And that will make the difference between one kid being 165 pounds and 175 pounds or 180 pounds. Or, you know, we see kids put on three to six miles per hour a year, depending on how hard they work and who they are and their mechanics and all this stuff. You know, if you're a pitcher, we just know that if you're doing the right things with us every year, you're going to probably be four to five miles per hour harder next season. And uh, 15 months is a whole year plus. So what could you have done with that 15 months? You know, it could have been that could be another three to five miles per hour. It could be another 15 pounds. It could be another six miles per hour bat speed. It could be another two or three tenths off your 60 time. It could be whatever it is. That's a lot of time to lose if you just start to wait too long. And we see tons of parents call us in December, tons more call us in January. And some even call us in February and we're like, what were you doing? You know, it's like, it's, I mean, your kid didn't get anything out of the off season this year. So you have to just really weigh like, okay, what do we want to do? When do we want to do it? How do we still create some sort of balance if they need balance? Some kids don't need balance. Uh, some kids just love baseball. I was that kid. I never needed balance from freshman year in college until my the end of my career. I just didn't. I was so passionate about getting to the major leagues and and building myself that there weren't many days off, and I didn't care. I, I was never burned out until the very bitter end when my body just hurt so much that it wasn't fun. But because I was driven – there was no bon- no burnout. I just wanted to go pitch and I wanted to like do everything I could to get better. So there's a lot of kids like that too, where kids are usually, I think getting burned out when they're, they're not the one driving the ship or driving the boat or driving ships and boats are the same. What am I, and this is not a great analogy day, but when they're steering their own ship, 
if they want to do baseball all the time, let them do baseball all the time. I mean, it's, it can definitely become a job over time, but they'll figure that out when they get there. But when a parent is like, no, you need to be in the gym three times a week, or no, you need to be doing this. That's when they get burned out because they're not doing it for them. But I personally, I don't get burned out on my own endeavors. I'm a hard worker. I'm constantly up doing all my online stuff. Now my podcast, my writing, my online courses, all these new things that I'm excited about the second phase of my life. Now that baseball is over, like I work a ton and I kind of slave away and I tell people that I don't have hobbies or free time. Like they're like, what do you do for fun? I'm like, I don't do anything, but I, but I writing is a sort of a meditative thing for me. It's a free time activity that I want to do, uh, creating things like my online courses and videos. Like I really like sharing stuff like this. Like, I don't feel like it's work. I could be watching TV right now or a movie, or I could be doing this. And I feel accomplished and I like doing this. Um, so for me, like, all the stuff that I do for a living is, like, what I like. And I don't get pas- I don't get burned out because there's still, like, passion for it. So you just have to figure out, if this, I'm talking to a parent, is that your kid? And is baseball his thing? Or is basketball his thing? Or does he really just want to have all different sports and like he loves them all equally and he doesn't want to do too much of any one? And that's okay too. Just try to figure it out and they should hopefully help you figure it out too. But if you're a parent that really pushes, like you need, if you want to be good at baseball, you better be doing your strength training. You better not miss it. Like you better do it. If they're not ready to do it, just let them not do it because they will get burned out that way. But if they want to go do it, they want to hit off the tee every freaking day for 150 swings. That's what Bryce Harper did, and I swear he never got I'm, – I'm sure he never got burned out because he's in the major leagues, and he, the guy loves to hit, right? So even the best athletes in the world, they put in as much, if not more, work than everyone else, and they also have the talent to, to go with it, and that's where they get where they get. So with all of that stuff together, you want to, again, map out, audit who you are. Be honest with yourself. If your arm strength sucks – Spend a lot of time on arm strength, kill it on arm care, go to a coach who will help your throwing mechanics, fix it because you've got to fix it sooner than later. If your forearms are your weak link, if your hamstrings, your glutes are the weak link, you just need to put on body weight. You just need to really strengthen your rotator cuff. You need to really get more flexible. Be honest with yourself and make sure you map out a good program from start to finish of who you're going to be next year. That is really important. And it's that time right now after the last season, go through your stats, go through, talk with your coaches be really honest and listen to their feedback and say, this is where you need to improve. And let's say, okay, next year I want to be here. Here's where I am today. What are the stepping stones that get me there next year? And that's a constant process. And uh, I know that every year when I finished my season, I took my week or two and I was thinking about what I need to improve on. And then I did a ton of it, you know, whether it was just focusing on working on my off speed stuff, because that was a major theme towards the end of my career getting better at repeating my delivery, getting bigger and stronger. That wasn't my thing at the end of my career. I was big and strong enough. That wasn't what was holding me back. There were mental factors. I learned to meditate. I did that consistently for a couple of years. And then I feel like I didn't need that as much anymore. And I tapered off of it. And uh, so it just, it evolves. It should always evolve because as you increase different things, like again, for me at one point, I was like a made man in the gym. I didn't need to get stronger. I was as big and physical and strong and flexible as I need to be. Sure, there were little things I could work on in the gym and I continued to work out until the end of my career, but I didn't need to work as hard in the gym. And to say that, oh, if you're not getting working harder, you're not getting better, that's, that's not really legitimate advice. You need to figure out what you need to be and then maintain it and then divert more of your energy to other things that you're not. So for me, I was as physical as I ever needed to be by like my probably second year in pro baseball. I was 205, very, very strong, very big, very flexible, my shoulder was in great shape. My form was in great shape. And then for me, it was like, okay, that's done. It's like finally like is probably done. Let's continue to train, but let's put a little more of my mental energy into mental stuff and to pitching more and playing catch more and like all these other things where you think, well, why don't you do, you just do have a finite amount of mental and physical energy. So again, you have to figure out if it's like your, your parents allowance, like here's your five dollars how do you want to spend it like every person has a set amount so you can't do six hours of training a day i mean it in the end that will just wear you out and uh so you got to figure out like how much do i want to do how much can i do and then what do i do with it so again that all comes back to your sort of off-season audit of yourself and just being honest 
All right. So this is that time of year where, you know, again, hopefully if you've, uh, you went through travel ball season and the team wasn't right for you, hopefully you found it a good fit. Hopefully you talked with your coach about it, why you're leaving, whatever. And uh, hopefully your coach was like understands and was kind about it. Like it's not that big a deal. It's youth baseball. Everyone wants loyalty, but loyalty also goes both ways. And again, I'd cut a kid. He's allowed to cut me back. That's only fair, right? So we shouldn't, as coaches, be terrorizing kids and bad-mouthing them and, and all this stuff if they leave your program. Like, look, it's just every year, no matter how good of a job you do as a coach, a certain amount of kids will probably leave your program for, for reasons maybe that do or don't involve you, whatever. And, uh, and, and same thing with, uh, with kids. Sometimes kids will try their absolute best, and you just have to cut them because they're just not good enough. And that's just part of baseball, too. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can stick by them and just be honest. Hey, you won't play very much, but if you want to stay with us, you know, we'll stick by you. And that's fair, too. We do that as well sometimes. So it just depends. But, like, all this crazy, like, bullying and, like, I don't know, like, you're, you're disloyal, and blah, 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 like, going in all directions, players, coaches, parents. It's just, it's just a mess. And it just doesn't need to be that way. Just it's not that big a deal. And then lastly... Make sure you're taking the time now to audit yourself, get a plan for the off season, know where you want to go, where you are now, be very honest, take the criticism and the critical feedback to heart and just go forward because this is that time of year where you want to be better. All right. So if you enjoy the podcast, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, subscribe on iTunes. I'm now on Spotify. Hopefully you're listening to on Spotify for me. That's pretty convenient. Not that I listen to myself because I don't, uh, but Feel free to check us out. If you want to sponsor the show, you can do so on our Patreon page. Uh, grab one of these lame t-shirts that I always wear, my book, whatever else. And uh, shoot me a comment, shoot me an email, shoot me a message on my Facebook message on my website. And if you have a suggestion or comment for the show, please just let me know. See you next week.